This morning we are going to talk about jet pumps. A look at one of the original pumps. To talk about jet pumps we need to understand centrifugal pumps because a jet pump really is two pumps in one. One of those pumps being a centrifugal pump. So if you look at our picture here you're going to see that the centrifugal pump has a suction. We call that the eye of the impeller. All right. The water is going to go in through that eye and then it's going to follow that vein around and we're going to increase the velocity of the water so it will start moving faster. We'll catch that water in an area and that you'll see expands and as that area expands and gets wider that water is going to slow down and we're going to convert the velocity energy that we added to the water into pressure energy. Now, just a few things about the impeller here. There's the eye. The eye is the entrance. All right. This is the impeller vein. That's the impeller passage. So between the veins is the passage, which is where the water is going to go. The impeller port is the area between the shrouds. So there's a front and back shroud and those shrouds enclose the impeller forcing the water to come out through the port. And of course that's going to give you the maximum increase in speed which means you'll also get your maximum flow and your maximum head out of an enclosed impeller. All right. The impeller peripheral is what's going to determine the maximum speed. So most motors are going to run at 3450 RPMs uh, it's the change in the impeller peripheral or diameter that is going to give you more speed. So, therefore, the faster the water moves, the more water I get. The larger the impeller diameter, the more water I get. However, the deeper I have to go to get the water, the more difficult it is to bring it up. So, Keeping the pump closer to the water vertically will help me get more water. We're going to take a poll here now. The poll is a, a simple question. And the question is, what is the theoretic static lift of a centrifugal pump at sea level? All right. Your choices are 25 feet, 28 feet, 34 feet, or 40 feet. And the correct answer is 34 feet. Now, that's at sea level. Okay? Most engineers, and this is why you hear the number 20, 25 quite a bit, because most engineers conservatively give you a 9-foot safety factor. Now, that 9-foot safety factor includes some inherent losses and stuff like that. So that's all going to wind up being in that 25 feet. So the practical lift is 25 feet. 9 feet of safety from 34 gives you 25 feet of lift. Now this is a jet pump. Remember what I said a jet pump is two pumps in one. All right. It is a self-priming centrifugal pump and a jet. All right. Now we're going to take a close look at a jet here because a jet has three basic parts to it. It has a nozzle. Number one is the nozzle. The nozzle, as you can see, is conical in shape. The entrance to the nozzle is the uh, bottom part there, the part that's got the larger hole in it. The exit is the smaller hole. Now what that means is it's kind of like taking your garden hose and putting your thumb over the end of the hole. And of course, what winds up happening? The water coming out of that hole comes out much faster. And so we use the nozzle to increase the velocity of the water coming out of it. The next part there is called the Venturi tube. The Venturi tube. The effect of a Venturi tube is very simple. You take that very fast moving water, it's moving so fast coming out of that nozzle that it creates a low pressure system. And that low pressure system is going to pull well water in. You're going to mix the well water with the high velocity water, and then you're going to send it through the Venturi tube. You can see that that, nozzle, uh, that nozzle's exit is right in the entrance of the Venturi tube. 
So you're going to send that uh, water up through that venturi tube. And the venturi tube, as you can see, it gets wider as it gets closer to its discharge. So where the nozzle is, where the nozzle is pointing at, that's the entrance. The other end is the discharge, and you can see the discharge gets wider. And it does the same thing that that pump body does. As it widens out, it slows the water down and converts the velocity energy that was added to the water into pressure energy, which means this is a pump all in itself. Okay? And, of course, it's got a pump body. So here's your jet body right here. Now, the jet body is designed a couple different ways. This particular jet body is called a double pipe, double pipe jet. You'll notice the two on the left-hand side are horizontal. The one on the right-hand side is vertical. You'll notice also when you look at the two on the left-hand side, the one on the far left has what we call the suction hole on the top and the drive hole on the bottom. That's industry standard. That is industry standard and uh, our SL and HL pumps are designed with that particular connection. We used to have a pump called the AL. The SL took its place. Exact same performance, but we changed something. What we changed was, and if you look at that uh, jet that's in the middle, you're going to notice that the drive hole is on top. So our AL and BBL series pumps had the drive hole on the top. When we switched from AL to SL and BBL to HL, we changed those two holes around. We went to what is called industry standard. Now, we did it for one very simple basic reason, and that is if we wouldn't have done it, we'd have lost the market because people were tired of having to buy a uh, reversing adapter in order, to, uh, get, uh, in order to get the pump hooked up properly. And so if they were uh, changing the pump out, they, it was hard to put our pump in when you had somebody else's jet already in there simply because of the fact that you had to get a reversing adapter because their pipes were set differently. So we switched and we went to industry standard, which again is the far left-hand picture. All right, The vertical picture is deep well. So the, the middle picture and the far left picture are what we call shallow well jets. They attach to the front of the pump, and again, they're going to be in a horizontal position, so they're good to about 25 feet. The picture on the right is a deep well jet, and deep well jets can go considerably deeper. It depends on the horsepower of the pump and the nozzle and venturi combination that you're using. I do want to warn you right in advance, nozzle and venturi combinations are particular to certain horsepower pumps. And so it's very important that you use the right jet with the right pump. Using a jet that's in there already may not work. So it's very important you understand that. So that's your drive or suction hole. There's your drive hole. Remember, that's industry standard. When you look here, this is the old stay right standard. Uh, the only pump that I can remember that we still use this particular standard on is the HMS series pump because nobody else makes a pump like the HMS. All right. So those are shallow well installation directly mounted to the pump. Over here, we've got the same two holes. It doesn't really matter where they sit down the well, so you put them down the well as you need them. And, of course, that is a deep well application. So you're going to connect the piping, put the, put the jet down the well, and then connect the piping to the pump. All right. Now, something else to note there, if you look at the end of the venturi tubes on the shallow well jets, you're going to notice they're round. They have to be totally round because we use that venturi tube to butt up against the diffuser ring, and that separates the suction side of the pump from the discharge side of the pump. So they're used as part of a seal. All right. If you look at the venturi tube on the deep well jet, it's very easy to see a set of 
uh, little cutouts there, and we use those to tighten the jet up. So we have an air tool that we use. We stick that jet in there, or that, that venturi tube in the jet, and we use the air tube to, to tighten it up to a certain torque. All right? Now, it's really hard to see, but if you look at those uh, horizontal ones, they also have little cutouts in them, but they don't go all the way through like they do on the deep well jet. So I had a guy call up one time, and we, we were working through the problem that he had, and it turned out the problem that he had was he ordered a deep well jet but wanted to use it as a shallow well. And so I said, well, sir, you, you've got the wrong Venturi tube there. You, you've got to get a different jet. So he said, well, can't I just cut it off? And the answer is no. Now, there's two reasons why that answer is so simple. The first reason is if you do not cut it exactly straight, if that's not flush, when you butt it up against the diffuser ring, it's not going to seal properly, and you get a recirculation of water, which is going to lower the pressure that you want. So that's number one reason. Number two reason, you shorten the amount of jet that's there to increase the velocity of the water. And so you change the velocity of the water going into the eye of the impeller, which, if you don't change it enough, is going to cause cavitation. So it's extremely important that you have the right nozzle and venturi combination. So make sure you're buying the right jet. We're going to talk about the differences there. All right, the HS series pump versus the S series pump. Uh, H stands for high service factor. S stands for standard service factor. Pretty simple, except for one thing. What does it really mean? What it really means is this. When you're using a higher service factor, you're going to decrease the horsepower of the motor. Now, you're not really decreasing the horsepower. You're just decreasing it in word. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that the S-series three-quarter horse is going to be the same pump as the H-series half horse. All right? We're going to show you that in just a minute so that you can see it and know exactly what's there. Okay? If you leave the service factor alone, you just have an S pump. So it'll be a higher horsepower pump. Let's take a close, close look at what it means here. So you've got the SN series pump and the HN series pump. And if you look really, really close at those, golly, they look awful lot alike. Okay? Here's what I'm talking about. All right, here's your HN series pump. Here's your SN series pump. Now, remember, H means high service factor. S means standard service factor. So you're going to notice here's the HNC. Here's the SND. The HN is called a half horse. The SN is called a three-quarter horse. C means half. D means three-quarter. At five foot to water... And notice that we give discharge pressures that are identical, 30, 40, and 50. You're going to notice that the, that the uh, water is the same. So at 30 PSI, the HN gives you 15. The SN gives you 15. At 40 PSI, the HN gives you 12 and a half. The SN gives you 12 and a half. At 50 PSI, the HN gives you 8. So does the SN. Okay. And, of course, that's what I'm telling you is that service factor is what makes the difference here. If you, lower the, if you raise the service factor, you lower the horsepower. All right. Now, there is one other slight difference in the pump, and that is the pressure switch that we use on them. All right. But you'll notice shutoff pressure is the same. If we run 40 PSI at 5 feet, they both have 12 at 15 they both have 10.1. At 25, they both have 6.8. They're the same pump. They use the same nozzle venturi combination. The only thing we change is the motor nameplate. And the motor nameplate changes the service factor, which changes the horsepower. Okay? Now, we're looking here. Uh, the pump on the left is a convertible pump. The pump on the right is a designated shallow well. All right, 
Now, what makes that convertible? What makes it shallow well? The shallow well pump, as you can see here, is going to have the jet built right into it. Now, when you get into the higher horsepowers, they might actually bolt the jet on. But the bottom line is, the jet is going to be attached to the pump, and that makes it a designated shallow well. The difference between it is this. When you're using a designated shallow well pump, you're only good to 25 feet to water, number one. But, number two, you're, you don't have as many cuts to make on that pump body. So because you don't have as many cuts to make on the pump body, you're actually saving a little bit of money. Okay? The section that I just highlighted around there in red is what we call the discharge side. Now, if you're following along in the training manual, we're on page 22, I believe. And what you're going to see in there is you're going to see a bunch of arrows. I took the arrows out because, well, let's just put it this way. On the screen, they're very confusing. So I just colored it a light blue and highlighted it with a red trim so that you can see which area is the discharge area. The dark blue area there in the front is called the suction side. So that's the suction side. Now the suction side includes the mixing chamber. Okay, so we've got our nozzle. And you can see the back of the nozzle is where the water is going to go in. So we're going to put some high-pressure water through the back of the nozzle. So what comes out of that nozzle? Velocity. So you're creating a high velocity here. All right? And, of course, what happens when the velocity goes up? Well, what happens is this. Pressure and velocity. As velocity goes up, pressure goes down. So we create a low pressure system right there at the discharge of the nozzle. Now notice the discharge of the nozzle goes right into the entrance of the Venturi tube. So what happens now? This is called the mixing chamber. It's where the well water, we create this low pressure system so the well water gets pulled in. It mixes with this high velocity water and it shoots into that venturi tube as it moves through the venturi tube you can see the opening is smaller here and as it goes through that opening widens out as it widens out it allows that water to go from high velocity to high pressure all right the eye of the impeller can handle pressure it can't handle velocity now it's going to go through the impeller through the diffuser and it's going to come out into that discharge area. Some of the water is actually going to be discharged but remember some of that water is going to come back here and be recirculated. So the bottom line is when you're using a jet pump you're sacrificing flow for pressure. If you really stop and think about it a jet pump is nothing more than a booster pump. That's all it is. It trades in flow for pressure. So it's just a booster pump is all it really is. When you talk about shallow well applications, there's a couple different ways that you can do a shallow well. First is, it's called a driven point. So the left-hand side there has the driven point installation on it. The right-hand side has a cased well installation. So we're just going to look at the driven point first. And the reason they call it a driven point is because what you have here is the stainless steel point with stainless steel screen. Okay, You're going to put a drive coupling to it and that drive coupling is going to allow you to smash it into the ground. So you get yourself a sledgehammer and you pound it down in the ground. Now I'm going to tell you a little secret here. Okay, These drive points come in two different sizes. Inch and a quarter and two inch. Which one do you think is going to give you more water? Yes, by the 2 inch. Okay, just a little tip right up front. A 2 inch uh, driven point is going to get you more water than an inch and a quarter driven point. So even though the suction is inch and a quarter on that pump, you want to use 2 inch pipe going down the well. When you come up and get to that priming T, then you can go ahead and go. Uh, two inch to inch and a quarter if you want. 
but you want two inches going down the well. The longer the pipe is two inch, the more flow you're going to get out of it. Okay. Now you're going to notice here that there is a section between the check valve and the water table. And that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at the section between the check valve and the water. That's all air. That's all air. You can prime the pump, but it's only going to prime to that check valve. So you want to keep that check valve as close as you legally can. Now notice how I said that. I was very careful. As close as you legally can. All right? Know what your local codes are. Some local codes say that that check valve has to be at least a foot off the ground. So know what your local codes are when you put that check valve in. All right? Because that area right there is all air. It's all got to be uh, evacuated before that pump is going to prime. All right? So we put a priming T in here. There's a plug that goes in the top of the priming T. And again, some people don't use a priming T there. Some people do. It all depends. If you're going to put another check valve or you're going to put your check valve at the suction of the pump, then you're going to want a priming T here so that you can get water between the uh, check valve and the well. Now the key to remember here is if you're dumping water in there and you don't have a check valve uh, after the priming T, that water is just going to go down the well. It's, it's not, you're not going to prime anything. Okay? So... Here's another priming T over at the pump. And again, that's, that's the one that you have to use to prime the pump. Remember, as you prime the pump, that water's going to go down that pipe and go to that check valve. That's why I'm saying a priming T at the well may not be necessary. May not be necessary at all. Okay? So remember, that's all air, and it's all got to be evacuated before that pump is primed. All right? Now, the difference between that driven point and the uh, well casing, the drilled well, is this right here. When you've got a drilled well, you can now put a foot valve on the bottom of that pipe. So instead of putting a check valve up on the top, you put a foot valve right down in the well. All right? We're going to make a suggestion. The suggestion is, and by the way, this comes right from the National Groundwater Association, the NGWA. Put the check or put the foot valve 10 feet below the water table. So whatever your drawdown level is, put that foot valve 10 feet below it. Try and keep it 5 to 10 feet off the bottom of the well. So, of course, when you're drilling your well, you need to calculate what your drawdown is so that, that way you can say, okay, we want to be 10 feet below the drawdown and we want to be 5 feet below the jet, so we got to be 15 feet below the drawdown. So when you go ahead and, and fill this all in or get this all set up, you've already drilled the well deep enough to allow for that. Okay. Again, you can put a priming T here if you'd like. Don't forget you need a sanitary well seal. You want to keep critters out of there. Mice, rats, small vermin getting in there is actually going to pollute that well. So you want to make sure they stay out. All right. You're going to want to make the pump work easier. You're going to want a vented well cap, but it's got to be a sanitary well cap. All right. Then the next thing we're going to note here is the priming T up on top. Again, because you've got the foot valve in there, what's going to wind up happening is you're going to prime that whole pipe. Now what that means is this pump is going to prime so much easier than the driven point pump because you don't have all that air to evacuate. There will be some bubbles because air is going to cling to the side of the pipe as you pour it and fill it full of water just like it does a glass sometimes but the bottom line is once you knock those bubbles off you're going so it's not a big deal all right deep well jets when you look at a deep well jet you have to remember that you're putting that deep well jet down the well all right there are two types of jets we looked at the four inch jet before the well casing that you're looking at right here is a special adapter 
it is designed for a two or three inch well. So you're also going to be using a special jet on your two or three inch well. Okay, when you've got a two or three inch well, notice that your jet looks a little different. The suction pipe is going to go right over the top of that Venturi tube. The nozzle uh, is just like it was before, right underneath that Venturi tube. So you can see where the Venturi tube screws into the jet, and the nozzle's right underneath there. And then you see that hole. That hole is going to allow the pressurized water in the well casing because you are going to use the well casing itself as the drive pipe. Okay, now the reason you can do that is because you've got what's called cup leathers. There are two of them. Remember, if you're using a two inch well, those cup leathers will be a little over two inches. If you're using a three inch well, the cup leathers are a little over three inches. All right, what happens is the cup leathers swell up, and when you put them down in that well, they seal the well. Everything above that cup leather can be pressurized. Everything below the cup leather is now going to be at gravity. So whatever the, whatever the static atmospheric pressure is, that's what your pressure is down there. Okay? So your suction pipe goes right over the top of that Venturi tube, screws down there nice and tight, and of course what's going to happen next is we've got two holes in our uh, adapter there. The top hole is going to be for the suction. The bottom hole is going to be for the drive water. All right. Now again, this is standard setup. So I'm using the standard adapter, two inch adapter, okay, or three inch adapter. So what happens is I bring the drive water out and run it through that drive hole. What makes this a special adapter is it sends that drive water right down into the well. Then it goes down through the well into that hole in the jet. Now, of course, it's pressurized water, so it's going to go up through the nozzle. The nozzle is going to cause a low pressure system that will draw, draw well water in. There is a foot valve at the bottom here, but that's okay. There's enough oomph there to pull that foot valve open. And of course, you've got a mixing chamber and you're gonna push that water through the Venturi tube now and into that suction pipe and then up the well, okay? Now, I wanna remind you of something extremely important here. It is very, very important that you use steel pipe. So you'll notice on the drawing there, it says for the two or three inch well, use steel pipe. The reason you want to use steel pipe is because I had a customer one time who used plastic pipe. What happened was he went to pull the jet out and he stripped the threads on the pipe that attached to the jet. He wound up leaving the jet in the well and then he took a steel pipe pounded the jet down as far as he could and put another jet over the top of that one about 15 feet now the reason for the phone call he couldn't get the pump to prime well once he told me what he did I realized he isn't going to get it primed the foot valve in the second jet doesn't have enough oomph to open up and it's sealed the well so he says, well, what do I do? And I said, well, your best bet is before that, those cup leathers lock up and won't let you pull out the second jet, get that second jet out of there. Then hire a professional to see if he can fish the first jet out. If he can't fish that first jet out, he'll drill you a new well. But the good news is you already got the jet for it. Okay? Wasn't what he wanted to hear, but what are you going to do? Okay? Now, the next one here is a double pipe jet. Remember, the double pipe jet is going to come with a nozzle and a Venturi tube. All right. You're going to put a drive pipe here, and you're going to put a suction pipe there. All right. There, those pipes are going to come up. The drive water is going to come down through the drive line and into the base where the nozzle is. And it's going to come up through that nozzle. 
Of course, as it comes up through the nozzle, it creates a low pressure system pulling well water in, in the mixing chamber, and then that water mixes with the high velocity water and goes up through the Venturi tube, and now we turn that high velocity into high pressure. And that's what allows you to push that water up from a much deeper depth. Now remember that this was the original pump we said. All right? It wasn't the first pump. But when you stop and think about it, it was the first pump that could go down deeper than 25 feet. A centrifugal pump can only go down about 25 feet at sea level. Yes, I know, there's some times where somebody says, oh, well, I get 30 out of mine, or I get 28 out of mine, and that's all possible. That's all possible. I'm not going to say it isn't. Uh, as I said, conservative engineers tell you 25 feet. Since most engineers are conservative, most engineers are going to tell you 25 feet. Okay? They put a safety factor in there that other engineers say, well, let's take a little bit of a risk, and maybe you can get it from 28 feet. So it's an ambiguous number. The other reason that makes it an ambiguous number is you got to remember that 25 feet came about in, in the 1940s. And of course, in the 1940s, they only had steel pipe. All right, so we're getting high pressure coming out of it and going up. And of course, as I mentioned, it's the original pump that allows you to go deeper than 25 feet. This was amazing back in the 1930s when farmers could get water from 100 feet. Today is not so exciting because you have to remember that because you're using part of the discharge water to increase the pressure and to bring the water up from a deeper depth, it's costing you money. These pumps are very inefficient and the deeper you go to water, the less efficient they are. Remember you're going down the drive pipe and up the suction pipe, okay? Standard today is suction over drive. All right, so the question is, what do you do if your suction and discharge pipes are reversed? Because remember, the old AL and BBL had drive over suction. And the answer is, you get a reversing adapter, okay? And again, this was the thing that people didn't want to have to buy it costs around a hundred bucks and who wants to pay an extra hundred dollars just so they can get a stay right pump so that's why we went to changing from the AL to the SL and the BBL to the HL okay now let's take a look at performance here again it's very important to remember that horsepower and jets work together alright so here's our HLC and we're in the, uh, we are in the um, Stay Right catalog, all right? And we're looking at the HL series pumps. Somewhere's around page 86, I believe, 87, all right? And when you're looking at these pumps, you're going to notice here that the HL series pump is called a half horsepower, and you'll notice it could use any of four different jets. Now, of course, remember, those jets means that the nozzle and venturi combinations are different on each one of them. And notice that they all do something a little bit different. All right? Two of those jets, the 54SD and the 55SD, notice they end in SD. When you order them, you order a PKG1 dash, and then whatever that number is with an SD behind it. SD stands for shallow deep. Now remember, the Venturi tube is going to determine if it's shallow or deep. That Venturi tube that's in this one appears to be a shallow well Venturi tube. The jet body is the same. The jet body is the same. I'll explain why in a minute. So, but the jet body for the shallow well jet is the same as the jet body for the deep well jet. They didn't used to be. They did not used to be, okay? The reason they are is because of this, the package CK. And you can see there's a CK3 and a CK5. You'll notice there's a big difference between the CK package and the SD package. When you looked at the SD package, you had one Venturi tube, 
all right? When you buy a CK package, you're going to get multiple Venturi tubes. Now, the story of how the CK package came about and why there's only one jet body. We hired a young engineer. His name was, you ready? Corey Coles, CK. Okay? He didn't want us to forget him. That's why he named the package CK. We asked Corey to go through our long list of jet packages and see if he could bring it down a little bit. So the first thing Corey did was go through the list and find jet packages that we don't use anymore and said, geez, you sell two or three of these a year, get rid of them. Now I want you to know those two or three customers were pretty upset when we got rid of them, but the bottom line is it cost us a lot of money to keep those jets in stock. And so we just got rid of them completely. Okay. Then he said, I noticed that this jet body and this nozzle work with this Venturi tube and this Venturi tube and that Venturi tube and that Venturi tube. So here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to suggest that we make a package CK. And each nozzle that has multiple Venturi tubes that go with it will put one of those Venturi, one of each of those Venturi tubes in the jet package. Here's where the problem comes in, and we do get this phone call every once in a while, especially during the busy season. Okay? I can't get the pump to prime. Which jet package do you have? I have a CK whatever. Which which Venturi tube did you put in? Whatever one was in there. And that's because they think that the extra Venturi tubes are just that, extras. They don't realize they're not extras. There's only one Venturi tube that's going to work with that pump. And so it's like, okay, have you got the other Venturi tubes? Well, yeah, I threw them in the garbage. Have you still got them? Yeah, go get them. So they go get them. They start going through them. I have them read the, jet, the, the Venturi tube number to me. When they get to the right one, I say, okay, pull your jet out. Take the Venturi tube that's in there out and put this Venturi tube in. Of course, their thought is, well, why didn't you just send the right one with it? We did. You just didn't look it up. Okay? So it's really important that you have the right Venturi tube. And I'm going to tell you a little secret right now. You can only find that Venturi tube in the condensed catalog. That's the only place that they mark the CK packages with the correct Venturi tube required for that job. Okay? So we're going to use this Venturi tube here, a J32P-26 or an N32P-66B, depending on um, which package we're going to use here. Remember, there's multiple Venturi tubes in there. Go through those Venturi tubes and make sure you've got the right one in the jet package before you put it down the well. All right? Notice the, the nozzles are going to be the same no matter which Venturi tube you've got there. The nozzles are going to be the same. Okay? So, make sure the Venturi tube is right. Now, the next thing we're going to look at here is our depth to water. At 20 feet, that CK3 with the J32P26 Venturi tube will give you 9.4 gallons per minute. The most of all four of them. All right. At 30, it goes to 8. At 40, it goes to 6.6. .6. And at 50, well, you can see you're, you're out of luck here. Okay. So, again, one of the reasons why you may pick a jet package is depth to water. If my depth to water is relatively shallow, 20 to 40 feet, I could use the CK3. However, if my depth to water is 50 or 60 feet, you can see I've got to pick one of the other jet packages. All right? Because otherwise, I'm just going to lose water. Now, I'm going to tell you another trick here. Okay? The trick is let's use that CK3. But let's put something here, because when my water table drops to my jet, I lose prime. Okay? So there's my jet right there. When that water table drops, I'm out of luck. Unless I put on what's called a tailpipe. A 
tailpipe. When you come to the factory schools, by the way, I ask you, uh, what does a tailpipe do? And, of course, one of the answers I always get is, well, it gets the exhaust to the back of the car. Okay, yeah, that, that's not the tailpipe I'm talking about, but it's a good answer. Good answer. Wrong, but it's a good answer, okay? The tailpipe does a couple of different things. One thing that the tailpipe does is it makes sure that you um, never lose prime. Okay, I'll say it again. You'll never lose prime with a tailpipe. All right? There's a reason why, because the tailpipe is 35 feet long. Yes, I want you to know that one time I was in a group of people who were discussing how to go about uh, writing a, a book for a training manual for somebody else that was including this tailpipe. And they said, well, really, it's only got to be 34 feet because... You're going to argue with a picture that's been out there for all these years. Make it 35 feet. Yeah, if you want to make it 34, go ahead. I don't care. All right? But the bottom line is you make that tailpipe long enough so that the water table can't drop. The pump can only draw from one atmosphere. And what you're doing here is by putting a tailpipe on, you're adding an atmosphere. So you're taking your deep well jet and adding a shallow well to it. Now, this is used in areas where you have fluctuating water tables. Here's the good news. All right. The good news is as the water table drops, you're still going to get water. Remember, our HLC at 40 feet to water was going to get 6.6 .6 gallons. At 50 feet, we said it was going to get zero. All right. If I'm using... A tailpipe, I'll still get 80%. 80% of 6.6 .6 is 5.2, almost 5.3. All right, at 55 feet, normally I would be out of water, but with a tailpipe on there, I'll still get 4.6 gallons of water. At 60 feet, I'm done. There's nothing coming out of that well, unless I got a tailpipe on there, then I can still get three and three quarter gallons out of it at 65 feet i'll still get 2.64 and at 69 feet i'll still get 1.12 at a time when i would normally be out of water now of course remember i'm 29 feet below the jet at this point and this is why i'm saying to you you can never lose prime because what will happen is it will draw down until it can't pull any more water in but the pump stays prime. Okay, that necessarily is not a good thing, okay? Because now you're deadheading the pump. But it's a fact you're not going to lose prime. All right? So two things the jet does for you. You'll never lose prime, and you can draw water below what the jet would normally draw water from. Okay? So that's a tailpipe. It gets used on a 4-inch jet. You don't use it on a 2 or 3 because they already have that smaller amount there. So you use it on a 4-inch jet and you can extend. Now again, it's used in areas where you have a fluctuating water table. If you're not worried about your water table, you don't have to put the jet, the, the tailpipe on there. All right? Let's talk about priming the pump. Okay, when you prime a deep well jet pump, note that there is a pressure regulator built into our jet pumps. All right, there are two compartments to a deep well jet. The larger compartment, which has the pressure gauge on it, and the smaller compartment. Now, the smaller compartment has a hole that goes all the way through, and we're going to put a pressure regulator in there. Okay? So the only connection between the large compartment and the little compartment is at the bottom of that pressure regulator. The pressure regulator is a little stem that has a flat piece going across the bottom of it, and that plate sits down on that hole and blocks the water. Okay? Now, of course... You're going to prime the pump, so you want to open that pressure regulator all the way up so you get as much water to go through there as fast as possible. Save you priming time. Okay. I'm also going to give you another hint here. You're going to use more than a gallon of water 
all right so make sure you got enough water around to prime the pump or you won't get it primed okay because you got to fill all the pipe all the way down the well remember that jet's going to have a foot valve on the bottom of it so you got to fill it all the way down to the foot valve yes at this point if you want to you could open up the priming plug at the well head and prime there if you want to but remember it's all going to go through the pump anyway okay so you go ahead and you fill your pump up with water all right now note too that besides having that discharge hole with the priming plug in it there's also a tube that tube is connected to the small chamber also and that tube goes back to the pressure switch all right so the tube is going to go back to the pressure switch and you're going to have um, that pressure switch now connect just to the small chamber you'll see why that's important here in a second all right the next thing you're going to do is you're going to close that pressure regulator all the way down so once you get the pump prime close the pressure regulator all the way down now remember that as that water moves through that piping system as it moves through that pump air bubbles are going to cling to the side of the pipe. I don't care if it's plastic pipe. If you've ever dumped water real quickly into a glass, sometimes air bubble will cling to the side of a glass. Well, guess what? If it clings to the side of the glass, it will cling to the side of your plastic pipe, and it will definitely cling to the side of your steel pipe. Okay? So you'll get some air bubbles in there. All right? So what are you going to do? You're going to close the pressure regulator all the way down, and you're going to turn the pump on. When you do, that's going to send all the water down the drive pipe, and it's going to bring all the water up through the uh, suction pipe. All right? Of course, remember, you're knocking all the air bubbles off, too. The pressure regulator is going to tell, or excuse me, the pressure gauge, remember it's attached to the large chamber, is going to tell you the maximum pressure it can build, which will give you a hint as to how deep you are to water. Okay? So look at that. Make sure you know what your what your uh, total pressure is. So that way, when you reset this thing, you got to say, "Well, geez, if I want 60 psi, and this thing shuts off at 62, that might be an issue." Okay. So now, of course, remember there's air coming up along with water, and so what's going to happen is that. Um, pressure gauge is going to get hit by air and then it's going to get hit by water and the needle is going to bounce back and forth like crazy okay so what are you going to do you're going to slowly start opening up the pressure regulator now you do it slowly because if you do it too fast you won't be able to react to what's going to happen next okay what's going to happen next is this water is going to start coming out now the first water that comes out is going to look like milk it's going to look like milk and the reason it's going to look like milk is because it's got all that air mixed in there let it sit it'll clear right up it's all water it's just white water because of the fact that it's so mixed with air all right now as the air comes out through the small chamber the needle is going to see less and less air and it's going to start to settle down this is why you want to open it up slowly because if you open it up too fast it drops like a rock and you lose prime so open it up slowly when you see the needle start to settle down all right you got most of your air out of there lock it up how do you lock it up turn it a quarter of a turn closed so open it till you see the needle start to settle down, then turn it a quarter of a turn closed, and you'll have it set for that depth of water. Now, these are special pumps. So far I've talked about the single stage uh, horizontal pumps. Now I'm going to talk about the multi-stage pumps. The pump on your left hand side is the HMS series. The pump on your right hand side is the MS series you're going to notice that because they are multi-stage pumps they had oop let me show you here pressure regulators that are external okay so you've got an external pressure regulator on these two pumps that external pressure regulator if you look at it closely this is what it's made up of this is what it looks like on the inside all right 
you're going to have a pressure gauge on it. You're going to have a body and you're going to have a bonnet. Inside that body and bonnet, between them is going to be a diaphragm. You're going to have cap screws holding them together. So you're going to have a diaphragm in there. You're going to have cap screws that are going to hold them together. And then on the body side of the diaphragm, you're going to have what's called a stem assembly. Stem assembly. Okay. There's going to be a valve seat and there's going to be a regulator guide. Those are going to be on the body side of the diaphragm. Now the reason that they're there is because on the bonnet side is going to be a spring and on the top of that spring you can see there's a little cap. There's an adjusting screw that sits on that cap and as you loosen or tighten the adjusting screw you loosen or tighten the cap. It's hard to see but if you look at that adjusting screw real closely you're going to see there's a nut on there. What you want to do is unscrew the nut all the way so that you can screw the adjusting screw all the way down. Now there is going to be a little plate on the bottom of that spring and that stem assembly is going to go up through the regulator guide and keep that guide in place and it's going to screw into that little plate that's on the other side. That holds that whole piece together. All right. So now what happens when I screw the adjusting screw down, I'm closing everything off. All right? So I close all that off, and as I close it off, you can see what happens. The discharge side of the, of the uh, pressure regulator has no water in it. The uh, inlet side is full of water. Okay? So now what happens is the same as before. I turn the pump on, I get some of the air burped out of it, and then I start opening up that pressure regulator. I take that adjusting screw and I start unscrewing it. Once I get it set where I want it to be, I take that nut and I screw that nut down nice and tight. And then that nut holds it in place. If you don't screw that nut down nice and tight, what winds up happening is the vibration of the water banging against the diaphragm causes the screw to unloosen and you wind up losing prime. So make sure you get that nut tied in there nice and tight. Now let's talk a little bit about how to prime this one because this is a little more difficult. Okay, First thing you're going to do is you're going to take the pressure gauge off of the pressure regulator. That's the hole that you're going to use to prime the pump. Okay, remember you're going to close the pressure regulator, so that hole is going to force the water into the pump and you'll fill it all up. Okay, now this is called a drain cock. You'll notice it's got two sets of screws there. That first set of screws is going to go into the pump. The second set of screw allows you to open or close the wing nut that's there. As you open and close the wing nut, you open and close the valve. All right, you're going to take that pipe plug out and put this drain cock in. This is the easiest way to prime it. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't do it this way, you're going to be priming it several times. Okay? This is called a bayonet fitting. The bayonet fitting. Now you'll notice the bayonet fitting has threads on the back of it. And guess what? If you look at that drain cock, inside of that wing nut, there's threads. Which means I can thread the bayonet fitting into the drain cock. So what you're going to do is you're going to put tubing over the top of that. When you pull on that tubing, all it does is tighten it up and locks it in place. All right? Now what you're going to do is you're going to take a, a five-gallon bucket of water. You're going to take that tubing, and as you prime that pump and water comes out of that tubing, you're going to stick it into the bucket of water. All right? Now what happens is as you move that air out of there, you're going to wind up replacing it with water, which is what you want to do. So it's a much easier way. You may have to reprime it once or twice, but you're not going to have to reprime it six or seven times. So that's the easy way to prime that pump. Last couple of slides here. 
This is a letter. As a matter of fact, I have the original letter in my desk. I'm not going to tell you who it's from or where it's from. But we did get this letter, and the guy was trying to explain to us how he's got his system hooked up. And we said, geez, you know what? Your letter is so confusing. Can you send us a picture? And he did. So here's his, here's his letter. Now, of course, we're taking some of it out just to shorten it up a little bit. My pump is a Stay Right SL Series Convertible Deep Well Jet Pump, 3 quarter horsepower, model number HLDL, code 1J01E004. Okay, so that tells me, the, the number 1 there in the beginning tells me it was made in Delavan. The J is the month, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J. Must have been about uh, September of 2001 is when that pump was made okay please refer to the enclosed picture i want it now notice what he says here i wanted a packer well packer well meant that he wanted to use a two or three inch jet that's called a packer okay looks just like that i wanted a packer well that would have lines three and five going directly into the pump without an ejector depicted in the photo Number one, the intake from the old well. So the old well was a shallow well, and now he's putting in a deep well. Okay? Number two is the shutoff valve for line one. Why you want to shut line one off, I'm not really sure. But let's shut line one off is what he's saying. Okay? Number three is the suction line from the new well. Now remember, that new well has the packer in it. Note both lines 1 and 3 are teed and goes into the ejector at the pump, the ejector that he didn't want. Okay? So we come out of number 1, we elbow, we elbow, we go through the, the valve, we elbow again, we go down to the T, and then we go into the pump. The new well, it's elbow, elbow, valve, elbow, elbow, T, pump. Yeah, okay. The good news is it looks like he's got some decent-sized pipe anyway. Now, the next thing that says here is he wanted it without an ejector, but there's the ejector, okay? So there's his new well with his valve. And he's got that injector in there that he didn't want. Number four, right here, is the water coming up from the well. Now notice what he says. That is from the old well. Look very carefully at what number four is. It is the discharge of the pump. Okay? He's got a quad sitting on top of it, so it looks like he's got about a 6-inch nipple in there with a quad sitting on top of it. The quad connects to the 6-inch nipple, it connects to the tank, it connects to a hose bib, and it connects to piping. Okay? That piping is number 5, which goes out to his garden hoses and down the drive line. So number 5 is also his drive line. Number 6 is a valve to shut off the water from going down the well. Now remember what that line is. It's a drive line. Okay? Now when I shut off valve number two, I do not get any water out of the new well, and no water is going down the drive line. With suction line three inserted into the ejector, shouldn't the pump bring water up from the new well even if there's no water going down the drive line and, this is a biggie, the well was installed correctly. I say, yes, I should have water. What do you say? I want you to know they wouldn't let me answer this letter. Okay? Because I wanted to start out with, what are you, an idiot? If you don't have water going down the drive line, how do you expect the deep well jet to work? It's got to have drive water. Not only that, even if he leaves number six open and he goes out to his garden and opens up his garden hose, 
All that pressure that needs to go down the drive line is now going out to the garden hose. There's no pressure going down the drive line, which means the drive line is going to lose water, which means it's going to lose prime. No, this is not going to work. There's no way in God's green earth that this is going to work. All right? If you're going to run a deep well jet, you've got to have drive line and you can't hook it up to a shallow well. It's got to be a deep well. All right? Because you've got to have a certain amount of back pressure going down that number five line. And the bottom line is he's not going to get that, especially with that garden hose open. Okay? So really important that you understand what's taking place there. Okay? So we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you very much.